and how organisms have evolved various mechanisms to uh, deal with the threat of deception in particular is, is a, a well worthwhile endeavor because I think there are a lot of interesting problems um, that arise surrounding deception. Uh, kind of more generally, um, I want to kind of think about the role of information in biology, sort of all the amazing complexity that we uh, enjoy studying in the natural world has, has arisen you know, largely because we've gone through a set of major transitions in evolution by which we have kind of uh, organisms coming together to cooperate at higher and higher scales of organization from, you know, um, from, you know, uh, replicating molecules coming together into protocells and protocells evolving into structured cells which clump together to make organisms which form together to make societies uh, and so on. So there's this sort of benefits to scale of cooperation that occurs at each level as we kind of uh, you know, head up through these major transitions. A huge driver of this, I believe, um, is, is information because there's a sort of information, if you're going to share anything, information is great stuff to share. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the best way I can express this is just to rip off a quote that's always attributed to George Bernard Shaw, uh, but seems to be actually you know, properly recorded nowhere. But in any case, the, the quote is, if you have an apple and I have an apple and we exchange apples, then you and I will still each have one apple. But if you have an idea and I have an idea and we exchange these ideas, each of us will have two ideas. So, you know, quite plainly, information works different than physical stuff. We can swap it and then we each are twice as rich um, afterwards. I gave this talk actually at a law school recently and people were really upset about being told to share by a celebrated socialist. Um, and so, uh, so I had to sort of amend this. Um, here's another one. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. Nature made ideas like fire, expansible all over space without lessening their density at any point. And it's sort of more reputable source if you lean in that particular direction. Um, so uh, this is, you know, this is, this is sort of why I think life is so interesting and biology is so interesting because Organisms come together, they share stuff, information is particularly good stuff to share. Uh, the problem is, you know, for those of you who followed the literature, you know that where there are apples, there are also snakes. And in this particular case, our snake in the garden um, is deception. The whole, you know, information sharing is wonderful, but if I listen to you, that gives you a handle with which to manipulate my behavior. And so if we're going to get information sharing working, somehow we have to overcome the problems that arise. And what I want to talk to you about today is, is how biological societies deal with um, deception at two different scales. First I want to talk, and, and I think it's useful to kind of separate these scales out uh, because they really do bring up a different set of problems. One is to talk about uh, um, how societies deal with deception by society members. So this is, you know, if we have communication among the intended participants, um, how do we deal with incentives for deception? So you know, classic examples in biology, mating systems, animals signaling their quality in mating, parent offspring conflict, organisms trying to extract resources from their parent. And then we have a sort of a second level of problem uh, of, uh, of how do we avoid uh, subversion by rogue outsiders. So now, the other, you know, sort of the deception doesn't come from the one you're supposed to be communicating with, but someone kind of comes in and, and, and you weren't, weren't even supposed to be interacting with them at all, um, and now they're kind of manipulating communication systems to their advantage. Um, so you can kind of, we can kind of see these in our own human behavior. Um, you know, so for example, suppose that I wanted to, um, because it's a wonderful book, own a copy of The Descent of Man and, and Selection and relation to sex and suppose that I were not on an uh, academic salary and I might want a first edition and so I could go um, and, and go to eBay and um, you know purchase here for six thousand dollars a first edition and this is actually when you think about it quite a remarkable thing that I can do this maybe less um, um, because you know what this is a person I've never met that I don't have any physical proximity to 
But of course, eBay gives us this institution with a reputation system in place, and so I can, with relative safety, actually exchange a huge sum of money um, to a person like this. The incentives for deception on the part of that, uh, that particular seller are largely taken care of by institutions that we've put into place. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't incentives for what I might call paltering, which is sort of um, not lying, but certainly playing loose with the truth. So I don't want to pay um, you know, $6,000. So I look on Google, eBay to send a man first edition, and I find, wow, here's a signed first edition for $225. That sounds like a really good idea. So, um, so I go take a look at that. And I, I, the pictures seem a little funny, and the year of publication is 1971, which is not um, quite what I remember. Um, and, uh, and then I kind of read the item description, and it's a first limited edition signed by the illustrator. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the point is we've got an institution in place. That institution, uh, re you know, rewards you for selling what it is that you describe. There's, it doesn't really reward you for being, uh, alt you know, completely forthright about what you're describing. I mean, as long as you put it in the fine print, you know, you can't, you haven't, you haven't done any kind of fraud or anything like that. And so there's still, you know, in this case, uh, some conflict of interest between a seller and I, and this is the sort of dynamic by which it plays out. And then there's this whole idea of sort of, you know, deterring deception by rogue outsiders. And so, um, I, you know, on my eBay kick, I get a, I get an email like this, um, and it's from, uh, a user my quality for with a question about an item, uh, which is a bit strange because I'm not actually selling anything on eBay. Um, but, uh, yeah, but it seems to be, you know, this message has come from eBay, or uh, you, you can't really read that there, but um, let's see. It's actually come from ebayinc.com. And if I go to the website, I click on that to get my message. I go to the website, and I have a nice opportunity to enter my ID and password. But look, we've got this funny numeric um, IP address instead of, instead of the eBay I expect up there. And of course, this is a phishing attempt. And eBay is trying to you know, educate people about how to deal with these. This is the same system. We've got this you know, communication transaction system in place. In the first case, I'm having an interaction with an intended recipient, you know, namely a, a, a seller. And there may be incentives for deception there. In the second case, of course, someone's trying to like, cut right into the middle. And someone who you know, isn't even an intended user of eBay, eBay wasn't designed for fishers, um, is trying to you know, cut in and and get my e email and password and do who knows what. Um, so what I want to talk about today is sort of how biological systems face you know, problems on each of these scales and how they deal with them. So sort of problem one, um, deterring deception by society members. OK, when we think about communication um, and, and deception, you know, when two members, when two participants have entirely coincident interests, there's no incentive for one to deceive the other. So now communi getting communication is relatively easy. Most of the modeling that's done in the evolution of language uh, is actually done under this assumption, which is, you know, kind of points to something that people ought to be thinking about more, um, it, you know, that there's coincident interest. And as long as I get the message across, it's all good. Um, if there are completely opposing interests, then there's no incentive to communicate. So there's no role for communication in zero-sum games, right? Um, there's no value to communication in a zero-sum game. So things are interesting in these cases of, of partially overlapping interests. So you know, some of our standard cases, and these will be familiar to a lot of you, I suspect. In biology, we think about a mother bird trying to feed your nestlings. Um, her nestlings have you know, a few states. They might be hungry, they might be greedy, but not so hungry, or they might be completely full. Um, when, they're, when they're hungry or greedy, they want to be fed. Um, when, uh, when, you know, but you only want to feed them as the mother when they're actually truly hungry. If they're just being greedy, you'd rather feed another one or take a rest or 
whatever the case may be. Um, and so here, notice we have this partial overlap of interest. You have common interests with the ones that are hungry and full, uh, but you have uh, non-overlapping interests with the ones that are greedy. Um, so uh, let's see. I guess that, that just pops that up there. Um, similarly, uh, you could think about a situation where an individual um, and, and so just kind of moving it into a different, into a different domain, uh, an individual selecting a mate. So you're a female sage grouse. Um, you want to select a mate. The males are all showing off. We've got males of qualities C, B, and A. Um, the males all want to be seen as A males. The C males would even settle for being seen as B ma males. It's better than nothing. Um, and you want to see these guys as who they really are. So um, you've got common interest here with the A males. So there's, there's, your, there's your common interest. They, they have this common interest with you um, of finding some way that they can dis, you know, distinguish themselves, separate themselves with the rest. Um, you've got this sort of partial interest with, the, with the, the B males, who at least want to distinguish themselves from the Cs. And you're basically completely opposed with the Cs, who would be happy to trick you in any way that they could. So these are the kinds of situations that are the classic uh, um, you know, examples we worry about in biology. You've, you've I'm sure, heard the, the various stories. Um, but the remarkable thing is that you know, somehow these incentives to deceive get handled. Because if you take a walk out in the woods, for example, um, and, and you'll, you know, you'll smell scents of flowers, and you'll hear the birds singing, and the, um, you know, in the fall you'll see bright colored leaves this time of year, and uh, um, you know, a butterfly will go flashing by, and, and you'll see a, a white-tailed deer with its tail flapping. And, um, all of the sort of sensory experience that we have when we go walking through the natural environment, some huge fraction of that is signals have evolved for the sake of signals. So like, you know, if you kind of just think about the sensory input that you're taking on, like tons of that has evolved for the purpose of signaling. Not necessarily to you, but of signaling. And so somehow this has been solved, which is, um, you know, those signals wouldn't exist as Maynard Smith and Harper uh, point out here, if they didn't carry some value to the receivers. These signals can't be pure lies, right? The receiver's not going to respond to, to uh, signals that, that aren't valuable on average, and if receivers aren't responding, signalers aren't going to send them and so forth. And in biology, you know, our classic explanation for this has, of course, been the, the handicap principle, Shahavi's handicap principle, the idea that you can take a costly signal like a peacock's tail to indicate quality, because healthy peacocks can afford to carry around this big handicap, and I'm just doing this loosely, whereas a uh, uh, peacock that's sickly and has poor genes and is malnourished and so forth can't afford to make the big tail, can't get away from predators when the tail is there, um, and so on and so forth. And sort of, you know, the brilliance of what Shahavi did was that he took these two problems that had bothered evolutionary biologists since Darwin. Uh, why is communication honest, and why are signals extravagant, um, and realize that they are the answers to each other, right? So communication is honest because signals are extravagant, and signals are extravagant because communication needs to be um, honest. So here's Jahavi. And what's interesting about, the, um, you know, one kind of interesting historical note about, about this whole costly signaling idea was it was developed in parallel at almost exactly the same time in economics and in biology. So Amas Shahavi um, came up with it in biology at a, you know, uh, two years before Michael Svens developed this in economics. Um, and there's kind of an interesting parable here for those who are kind of trying to think about whether to um, head in a more mathematical um, direction. Shahavi did, when he presented his work, exactly what he's shown doing here. He waved his hands um, a lot. and uh, and as a result, people weren't quite sure whether his theory was right or wrong. And in, and in fact, a lot of leading biologists, including John Maynard Smith and Elon Eschel, published papers with titles you know, in the, in the, the mid-'70s, published papers with titles like, The Handicap Principle Does Not Work, um, and so on, because they couldn't pin down what he was talking about. Michael Spence has uh, better control of his hands and was rewarded with a visit to the King of Sweden. So. Um, 
little parable about the value of mathematical uh, frameworks in, in, in convincing people of ideas. Of course, the basic, you know, so the basic thing and I, um, that, that we can do in order to you know, follow Spence's lead or to bring it into biology, which Graffin and others did, uh, is to sort of think about communication as a game. We've got a couple of players, Alice and Bob. Um, Alice has some private information about the, uh, about the world. She can then send a message to Bob, and Bob then chooses some actions, um, uh, uh, and those actions then have uh, payoff consequences for, for both participants. We can, of course, take a game, and I'm not going to go through the, you know, the details, but we can take a game like this. We can write it down in, in kind of game theoretic form, um, in extended form. And what we're looking for when we're trying to find you know, honest communication despite conflict of interest is a, is a signaling equilibrium where um, you know, high quality individuals send one signal and uh, the receivers accept and low quality individuals send a different signal um, and the receivers reject. So there, there we have kind of a um, an honest signaling equilibrium. And you can do a ton of mathematics about this and kind of work out uh, you know, what these signaling equilibria look like and, and, and characterize them um, for any particular system. Fortunately, we can capture you know, almost all of the intuition. And I realize some of you will be uh, familiar with these diagrams, but, but they're going somewhere useful, I hope. Um, we can capture almost all of the, the intuition uh, with kind of simple picture. And we think about, um, you know, so here we'll, we'll do a sexual selection case and these different male weaver birds are trying to impress females and so they're going to send a signal. The larger the signal, the more mating they get. In this case, the signal might be tail length. Um, and so for a low quality, so here's the benefit. And you know, a low quality male has these sort of sharply accelerating costs of producing a long tail. It's just, it, it does make it harder to fly. Um, and so the costs are there and so what the bird can do is a little bit of calculus and check a first order condition and find, or you can just you know, set the slopes equal or you can let evolution do the work and then you find um, you know, here's the optimal tail length for a bird of this size. Right? There's the biggest difference between the fitness gain and the fitness cost. Take a bird um, of medium condition, its costs are a little lower and so it can make a slightly larger tail. Take a bird in high condition, um, its costs are lower yet, makes a yet larger tail. And so from a picture like this, we see that the basic predictions of Jahavi's model are borne out. There's two things going on here. Signals are honest. The high quality bird has a bigger tail than the medium, bigger than the low. And signals are costly. All of these birds are expending a non-trivial amount of um, fitness in order to produce a tail of that size. These are, the, these are the sort of realized costs. So this is a very Jahavian picture. We can do the same kind of picture for a case of the begging baby birds. In the models that people usually do, they typically have the uh, fitness cost is now constant. The fitness cost is attracting predators. It doesn't matter whether you're hungry or not. You have the same rate of attracting predators, but the benefits now vary, right? So the hungry bird has really, really high. Uh, you know, the starving bird has really, really high benefits, hungry, medium, full, lower. Um, and you know, again, we have, uh, you know, again, you have these different uh, optimal signal levels. Again, signaling is honest. Again, signaling is costly at equilibrium. And so that's the kind of Jahavian framework. Um, but there's sort of three, at least three major problems with this framework. And um, the first is just that, well, you know, it's obvious. Costly signaling is, is costly. Um, and in fact, it's too costly. So in sort of my first scientific paper uh, ever, I, I was thinking about this problem and, and just noted that um, the cost that the mothers and the baby birds pay at the signaling equilibrium where they communicate honestly leaves everybody worse off than if mom had just guessed. And so it's great, you've got honest communication. Um, and that was sort of true in the paradigmatic models that people were using. It's great to have honest communication and it's indeed evolutionary stable once you get there, uh, but it's not worth it. So one problem. Um, another problem, I think a really interesting problem, is that costly signaling doesn't work well for combinatorial communication. 
So I think any theory of signaling should be able to explain what it is that I'm doing now, which is speaking to you in, you know, using combinatorial um, language. But there's, it's impossible to build uh, a system of signal costs that'll take adequate, uh, that'll sort of allow you to make adequate use of combinatorial communication. And I can show you with a very simple kind of language game here. Um, so imagine that you have a language game in which you ask your neighbors for assistance when you need it. Um, and so you've got three words for number, one, two, and three. And you've got three kinds of food, apples, loaves of bread, and, and chickens. And um, so you might say, you know, if you need that, I need two chickens. Or you might say, I need three apples. Or you might say, I need one loaf of bread. Now the problem is, um, how much should these different signals cost? Well, by moving from the number two to the number three, I can always get an extra chicken. So this cost difference has to be at least the value of a chicken. But then why would you ever ask for three apples? Because then you get one extra apple, but you pay a chicken in order to get it. So basically, there aren't enough degrees of freedom to assign appropriate costs of production to the various um, words that you would use in a uh, in, in a combinatorial communication system. And that's the whole point, right, is that the sort of number of messages that you can send blows up uh, with the number of words, but, but then you can't assign costs in ways that, that make all of this honest. So if we're going to communicate combinatorially, signal costs can't be associated with signal production. Uh, a third problem that we've been working on a lot recently, and I'm not going to talk about much here, uh, is that costly signaling systems are equilibria. Um, but you can't actually reach them, uh, or most of the time you can't actually reach them. So this is just a face of a, of a, of a signal uh, space, um, and you know, it shows evolutionary dynamics on this face uh, as a function of where you start. And so up here is a costly signaling equilibrium. This is a so-called pooling trap where nobody says anything and nobody pays any attention. And this is a very funny kind of signaling um, equilibrium known as a hybrid equilibrium that uh, I'm not going to talk about, but, but that's been something I've thought about a lot recently, um, in which a little bit of information is imparted at very low cost. People have these low reliability signals. And, and, and much to my surprise, they have interesting evolutionary stability properties. And the whole point is that if you start almost anywhere in this phase plane, uh, you'll either end up orbiting this, uh, this um, hybrid equilibrium, or you'll get sucked down to this pooling equilibrium. It's, it's quite hard to actually end up at the, at the signaling equilibrium. So when we start to actually, you know, the, the, the sort of standard approach in biology has been to say, this is an ESS, that's an evolutionary attractor, therefore we will, um, you know, therefore evolutionary dynamics will take us there, therefore that's what we expect to observe. And so sort of taking it one step further, um, you could actually look at the evolutionary dynamics. It's mathematically a little bit more difficult, but um, uh, it you know, gives you a better picture. And when you do that, you find that it's uh, very, very hard to actually reach these costly signaling equilibria. Um, so we've got all of these problems, and we want to try to, uh, you know, try to come to some resolution. And to do that, I want to turn and, and take a look at the sparrow. Because um, the sparrow has a very interesting example with its badges of status. So here we have two different sparrows. Um, this one is a low status sparrow. It's got a very small black badge there. This is a high status sparrow with a very large um, black chest badge. Now, it's not like these things are limited in terms of the uh, the chemicals necessary for black pigmentation. There's no appreciable cost to making one signal or another. This is a so-called uh, conventional signal. Um, meaning has been dissociated from the physical cost of actually producing this. So in order to actually get the costs right here, we need another kind of a shift. Um, fortunately, we can modify our model just a little bit um, and understand start to understand how, co how signaling, you know, in this same pictorial framework, doesn't have to be costly at equilibrium. Imagine that for some reason the costs had a sharp kink in them. You, if you signal up to here, it's free. Above that, it starts to get 
very expensive quickly, then the optimum is right at that kink. And there's nothing special about the fact that that's a discon discontinuous function. The same thing um, holds as you look at you know, well-curved functions and so on. Um, you can make signal costs arbitrarily low. Uh, you know, for a medium individual, maybe can signal a little bit more with, before the costs kick in. A high-quality individual can signal even a little bit more. And what we see that's happening um, in this picture now, the signals are honest, but they're no longer costly. The expressed signal cost um, you know, at equilibrium is zero for everybody. And when we you know, do this, this is just sort of a graphical illustration of something you can go back and demonstrate mathematically uh, that is the entire statement of the costly signaling theory is off by a little bit. Um, signaling theory predicts that signals are honest not because of their cost, but rather because of their marginal cost. It's not that it's the expressed cost of producing the signal that makes it honest. It's the fact that if you deviated, um, particularly deviating in sort of the direction that you would want to, it would suddenly get very costly. Um, so we can, in fact, have uh, honest low-cost signals as long as the production, as, as long as the costs associated look like this. Now, part of the problem is, is that there are fairly few kind of physiological uh, structures that we could build that, that would have costs that looked like this. Um, though perhaps you could come up with some. The thing that does have costs that look like that, uh, very, it can have costs that look like that very easily is, is the actual responses of other individuals in the population. So on, for a peacock, you know, for our peacock case where signals actually have to be costly, we have our signal costs coming producer side. The, you know, Alice um, takes on this cost herself in the process of, of actually making the signal. Um, as we move to the sparrows, we now have signal costs that go over to the receiver side. What happens is you know, Alice sends a signal, Bob watches the signal, and then responds in a way that is very costly to Alice if the signal is an exaggeration. So what happens um, in experiments with these sparrows is if, as Sievert Rower did at the UW, you add a little bit of shoe polish to the, uh, to the chest of a low-quality male, it'll do well for about three minutes, and then the game will be up, and it'll be mercilessly beat up by the other sparrows in the population. So they come through and impose these high social costs um, uh, you know, and so the cost by transferring over here, um, you know, puts these kinds of functions into place. Now, um, by doing that, you notice you can also assign, if the costs get shifted over to the receiver side, you can now also assign different costs to all of the different possible combinatorial signals. So you get past this problem we were looking at earlier. Uh, with combinatorial signaling. You shift costs to the receiver side. You can now use combinatorial signaling and stabilize it with, with uh, costs from the receiver. Um, feel free to defer this to the discussion. Yeah. Or perhaps you want to get to it. But, I mean, in the Sparrow case, it must be the case that the, that the high status individual in this case punishes the falsely signaling low status individual has access to other information that reveals. Right. Right. So uh, that's a special kind of a signal because it's really just bookmarking a, a large set of observable features of the organism. It is not the sole message. Um, that's right. I mean, I think it's, well, it's probably the sole message from the initial presentation. You know, you see the bird. Um, and the same thing with you. You look like a pretty tough guy, but I give you a push. And you kind of maybe you stagger backwards, and I think you know maybe I can take this guy. Um, it's it, there's there's a difference between you know what you uh, what you present and then how you respond to to these interactions. And so with the birds, you know what'll happen is is if and, and it may well be that that someone also says, "Gosh, that guy looks a little small to have such a big black badge," um, but um, the birds, it's it's in the subsequent interactions uh, that the, that these problems, um, that, that the discrepancy is sort of worked out. Um, so there's been interesting work that Elizabeth Tibbetts has done with, uh, with wasps um, that have a similar um, conventional signaling system. And, uh, and it turns out if you, um, 
if you hormonally alter the ones at the same time as you uh, alter their appearance, then they also act like high status individuals and then they get away with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in, this is definitely a case, I mean, the signal is verifiable and this, this I think partly tells you the difference between, you know, why does the peacock have to pay all of this cost whereas the, the sparrow gets away doing this for free? Well, the, you know, the peahen would have to sort of count surviving grand offspring and look at their reproductive value to know whether the male was telling the truth. The sparrow, it just takes a little shove and they can find out right away. So it's this sort of time scale and, and ease of verifiability, which then you can also sort of carry into human um, things and think about why humans use uh, true costly signals versus spoken claims and so on. Um, Okay, so yeah, so I think that shift over to the receiver side is important. There's kind of an obvious question that then arises. Um, you know, you can object, well, why does the receiver impose a cost? Um, haven't done this formally, but you know, there are, there are a bunch of different possibilities. You could use a motion as a commitment device. Um, and Dan's talked about that. Um, one interesting one is that retaliation allows me to recoup losses. So think about the difference. Uh, between you drinking my beer and you stealing my wallet. You, could, you drink my beer, I could run after you, beat you up, I'm not going to get the beer back. But you steal my wallet and I run after you and I have to beat you up to get my wallet back. So there are some kinds of situations where I have to punish you in order to recoup my losses. One such example is if you very conspicuously socially claim high status. You come walking in here with a big black badge and, uh, you know, and, and the other birds think, oh, you know, that, that's a really high-ranking bird. How can I recoup my high status? Well, one way to do it is to beat you up badly in front of the other birds. Um, so uh, in these, these kinds of cases, that may be one reason. There's you know, another reason um, you know, is the whole story of you know, I'm, I may, you know, what, what's the cost to you of lying? Well, you know, a more complex society, you're going to have options for sort of partner choice and reputation scoring, and so you've got a reputation that 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 goes along with uh, along with you and your behavior, and 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 if you take a hit to that, that reduces your desirability as a partner, and that has its costs. Um, and people like to talk about being cheated. It's valuable information to be traded. So there's this there's this kind of uh, triangle, um, this sort of virtuous cycle that. Uh, Eric Alden Smith pointed out to me uh, that that happens with um, you know receiver side costs and uh, as soon as you go to receiver side costs now you can do combinatorial signaling and uh, referential signaling once you have referential signaling now you can gossip you can talk about what other people did I can not only uh, think that you know Jacob did something bad to me but I can now tell other people that Jacob did something bad to me which now, of course, increases many-fold the costs that I could impose on Jacob, supporting the idea of having receiver-side costs and the whole system can, can take off in this very positive way. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the, that's the kind of the, the first picture is just an, uh, that I wanted to show, how to think about deception uh, within a society and how to sort of uh, build upon the, the handicap principle, which has some elements of, of truth to it, but think about it a little bit uh, more, in a little more sophisticated way so that it, it makes sense for humans among other creatures. Um, the second thing I want to talk about, this is all new work, unpublished, um, may be terrible, who knows? Um, you can decide. So, um, it, but anyway, uh, Deterring deception by rogue outsiders. And I want to start by just simply asking this question. How do you win an evolutionary arms race? There's a ton of evolutionary theory on this. And the usual answer is, you know, this is all the Red Queen theory, is you run or rather evolve quickly. I'm in an evolutionary arms race. I just need to out-evolve my competitor. Um, but there's, of course, a second way to do this. I don't actually have to run quickly if I can force my competitor to run slowly. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is how competitors can be forced to run slowly in evolutionary arms races. And like so many other sort of big ideas in game theory, 
um, and related disciplines. I think we can trace this idea remarkably back to John Nash. Um, in the early 1950s, um, you know, Nash was really, really interested in, uh, in the arms race between code makers and code breakers and in um, the sort of in the race between enciphering and deciphering and sort of, you know, uh, put it in kind of historical context. This is this very pressing issue for national security. You've just had here this triumph of Alan Turing at, at Bletchley Park cracking the Enigma machine. Um, and you know, people are realizing that encoding and decoding is absolutely essential for uh, military security. And so Nash set himself the following problem. He wanted to know, well, can any code be cracked? And if so, how? Um, you know, is there a mathematical way to think about this? And the sort of, con you know, the flip side of that problem is, is can you make an uncrackable code? And, and how would you do that? And so what, what's really cool is that just last year, um, there was a letter that was recently, that was declassified, um, that was sent in 1955 from John Nash to the, to the NSA. Um, and what Nash had done is he you know, worked out all of this mathematics and he actually built an enciphering machine that he thought would be um, uncrackable. Um, and then he had the mathematics to explain, explain why. And sort of in the process, you know, he developed most of algorithmic complexity theory, um, which was completely, of course, unknown because it was classified by the NSA and Nash never did anything with it. And, and, it was redeveloped decades later. Uh, but the, the sort of core of, anyway, so Nash, you know, it's also fun to just look at this. I mean, you can kind of imagine being the general at the NSA who gets, gets this and, you know, the, you're sure the aliens are sort of right there. And it's, it's you know, not the, uh, yeah, it, um, it, it doesn't inspire confidence, but, but it turns out to be brilliant. So if you read the thing, and you can read it, it's online, um, what Nash, you know, sort of Nash's conclusion is he says, you know, for almost all sufficiently complex types of enciphering, especially where the instructions given by different portions of the key interact complexly with each other in the determination of their ultimate effects on the enciphering, the mean key computation length, the mean time it takes to compute the key, increases exponentially with the length of the key. And so among other things, he'd figured out what all computer scientists, you know, uh, you know, sort of think now that, you know, well, if a problem takes exponential time, it's effectively unsolvable, right? Uh, if P equals NP, which it probably does, but no one can prove, which we won't go into. But I can take questions on it. Not that I understand it. Um, and then the next thing is super cool. Um, Nash, and so I'd kind of written the first draft of this paper before the letter was declassified. Um, Nash interprets the whole point of my, or sort of, uh, you know, also intuits the whole point of my paper without even knowing that it's a problem. He says, as ciphers become more sophisticated, the game of cipher breaking by skilled teams, et cetera, should become a thing of the past. So this arms race goes away because you can make codes exponentially hard to crack. Um, and it turns out that, you know, the machine that he developed is basically a primitive version of RSA encryption, which is, you know, the standard way that you build codes that are exponentially hard to crack. Um, of course, the NSA, and, and not completely to their fault, I mean, this is so far ahead of its time, but they, they read it, they couldn't make much sense of it, um, and, uh, you know, stated that um, Dr. Campaign has been informed that the reply has been written and is not interested in further coordination. So they dropped drop the ball on that one. But I think the fundamental idea is really cool and may have some applications in biology as well. And it's an idea that I'd call defensive complexity. It's an idea that a mechanism can be made secure against subversion by using, um, by using the intractability of the mechanism or the time complexity of, of learning it uh, as a defense. So in a coevolutionary context, a system manifests defensive complexity if an adversary population will take a long time to evolve to subvert it. So if I deploy some kind of a system in an arms race and it's going to take you a very, very long time to evolve to, to beat it, 
You know, that's a way I can win an arms race. Um, and, and it turns out, I think, to be a very, very important one. Because think about the arms race between uh, large multicellular creatures and their bacterial or viral pathogens. Um, you know, bacteria can have uh, generation times of 20 minutes. Ours are 20 years, right? So now we're locked in this evolutionary arms race between pathogenic bacteria that evolve 100,000 times faster than us. That's a huge problem. Uh, you know, how is it that we can possibly stay out ahead in that evolutionary arms race? When you sort of think about it, I find it uh, you know, really remarkable that, um, that multicellular creatures can exist at all. And you know, the way we do it is we deploy immune systems. But if you kind of start to think about uh, what an immune system has to do, it's really remarkable. You think of the kind of things your immune system has to do. It's got to be highly sensitive, so it needs to um, you know, be, be screening the body, uh, the whole body, and responding very early to an infection, because if you wait too long, the infection will already be at high, high frequency or high density in your body and, and overwhelm you. Uh, it needs to have incredible breadth, right? It has to be able to recognize any new pathogen. It's not enough to just recognize old ones that were there a long time ago because you've got kind of continual process of zoonotic uh, diseases. You've got uh, all kinds of antigenic shift and changes in the pathogens that are human associated and so on. So it's got to be able to recognize anything, not just ones that have been problematic before. It's got to learn. So the only way it can do this sort of, rec I mean, it's got to figure out what's self and what's non-self. You have this organism, if it's a sexual organism, that has its, you know, its collected genes are coming from two different sources. So you sort of can't you know, have a list of the, you know, the genes of the proteins that you, that you make you know, kind of from one place because you have, you have you know, the whole uh, process of gametic fusion where you're coming from the two parents. So you've got to, you, the immune system has to actually learn what's self and what's non-self. It's got to be highly specific when you go and try to wipe out a, a virus. You don't want to also take out you know, your liver as kind of um, uh, collateral damage. It's got to be massively amplified, right? So you've got to, you, know, you have a small signal of danger early, and you amplify this into a huge response of, of many millions or hundreds of millions of responding immune cells. Um, it's got to be coordinated when you produce that many immune cells. You, you know, it's like producing a distributed tissue, and you need to regulate and coordinate the, the growth and activation of that tissue, just like any other. Um, and while we're at it, it would be really nice to have memory as well, so you could make use of prior experience. So this is, this is just sort of enormously hard um, computational task that, that the immune system has to be able to solve. And it's got to do all of this in the presence of two additional challenges. You've got to avoid autoimmunity. You can't afford false positives. That you know, leads to autoimmune disease. And you've got to avoid subversion. So pathogens have evolved all kinds of ways to um, disrupt the immune system um, and try to take control over the immune system in many ways. So, you know, the pox viruses are particularly uh, notorious for this. They, they make proteins that stimulate your immune receptors. They alter your own production of those proteins. They make decoy receptors that mop up the signals. Um, they do things that block the receptors. They sabotage the signals. Mm -hmm. Why do you say amplify instead of just a big response? Um, because, I, I, because you're going from a, you're basically, you're amplifying it because you're going from a small signal that's typically, you know, going to be detected on a, on a, you know, by a single cell somewhere um, to a very, very large response that involves millions of cells doing something. Um, and so that, that, that's just a form of signal amplification, which is, great, um, but where you have signal amplification, you, have, you take on these huge risks of mistakes, right? Any, um, and so that's the, and, and the other problem, you know, if, I'm not going to talk about it, but the other problem with amplification is you can get stuck in runaway positive feedback loops. So anywhere you have amplification, you also need safety valves. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, okay, so Pox viruses do lots and lots of bad things. So we sort of look at what are the challenges for immune function. Well, the, you know, the goal of the immune system is not to clear pathogens, of course. Its sort of fitness goal is to 
reduce the damage from pathogens. That's what it's been selected for. Some of them may be better to live with um, than, to, than to clear entirely. Um, that's why immune responses will shut down after 14 days if they haven't made any progress. It's either something you can live with or it's yourself. And either way, you should, you should just leave well enough alone. Um, they got to do this while avoiding autoimmunity. And they've got to avoid subversion. And the really awful thing is that these two are in sort of diametrical opposition. Because how do you avoid immunity? You put mechanisms in place that allow you to shut down immune responses. Um, what do the pathogens want to do? They want mechanisms that allow you to shut down immune responses. So how do you do this in ways that can't be subverted? It's a very hard um, sort of logistical problem. Um, and so, yeah, so you've got, you know, say, say it again, you, you know, you, communication is absolutely essential to regulate the, the um, immune response, and you need to be able to shut down unwanted reactions. But communication can be subverted. And what you're left with is what, the, what computer scientists call a Byzantine general's problem. Uh, this, is, you know, this, this is going back to a story about a set of Byzantine generals that want to make plans to attack. And they can send messengers among, among one another. But uh, there are N generals, and some smaller number M of them are traitors. And they want to try to find a way to coordinate their attack. And it turns out if you know, the theorem is if they're if fewer than a third are traitors, they're in good shape and they can do it. And if more than a third are traitors, um, then they've got a serious problem. So um, anyway, um, we have yeah we have that kind of problem, um, and it and it it uh, brings me. I mean, in, in biology, I like to think about this as sort of a distinction between robustness and strategic robustness. So we talk a lot in biology about robustness preserving phenotype or function despite variation um, in the environment, noise, and component failure. And then strategic robustness uh, is you know, preserving phenotype or function despite directed attempts to sabotage the system. So now the failures aren't random. The perturbations aren't random. They've actually evolved to, to break things. Um, and so, you know, so in our puzzle, we can come back to our puzzle. You know, why don't pathogens evolve to shut off immune responses? Um, and what I'd like to propose as a hypothesis is immune systems are defensively complex. The kind of control logic, the way that the many cytokines interact to turn parts of the immune system on and off, um, and the way the cells interact is, is defensively complex. And um, if that's true, it, 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 it helps with a. Uh, something that's always puzzled me, which is that mice and men diverged about 100 million years ago. Um, but almost, so you've got 200, years, 200 million years of adaptive evolution down those two evolutionary branches. But almost everything we know about immunology, we learn from mouse models, um, which is amazing. Um, but we get away with it because the cytokine signaling networks between mice and men are very, very highly um, conserved. They have this, you know, they have this very, very elaborate structure with many kinds of cells. This is an old diagram, so it's only got part of the picture, but you know, many, many different cytokines going back and forth between many, many different cell types, um, you know, regulating the uh, the immune um, response. So it's kind of funny. I mean, you've got this, uh, you know, coevolutionary arms race between hosts and pathogens. Um, you know, that's going to be centered on trying to disable the immune response, and yet it's completely static evolutionarily. Uh, you know, it hasn't changed in 100 million years. And in fact, if you go in and, you know, do tests for natural selection, most of the cytokines show purifying uh, selection. That is, they've, they've been selected to stay the same over evolutionary time, whereas the sort of immune effector molecules, the, the, the molecules that actually interact directly with the pathogen but aren't involved in the control logic, um, all show positive selection, selection for change over time. So, um, you know, if the if the defensive complexity hypothesis is right, it it, it helps us with that uh, with that you know, otherwise quite strange puzzle. Um, what I want to do just to finish up is talk a little bit about how we'd model um, the story, and so we'll go back to our kind of basic diagram of communication. Um, you've got. Uh, private information going from Alice to Bob. But now Alice could be one immune cell in the body, and Bob would be, say, another immune cell 
uh, in the body. Um, we already know a little bit about how they how, you know, how we'd model them communicating, but what we have to do here uh, is add a third party, Eve, uh, who can operate in the middle. This is the pathogen can actually you know, alter the message. The pathogen can do what pox viruses do, upregulate cytokine signaling, destroy a cytokine, produce a decoy receptor, um, whatever. So we want to think about a scenario like this. And so I present what I'll call a signal tampering game. And it's a game with, with two players. There's a host who process, and this is just kind of a simplified, you know, schematic version of, of this story. You've got a host who processes information, and you've got a pathogen who tampers with, with the signals that the host uses to process the information. So, you know, my basic view is you've got some external cue in the world. The host uh, has a sensor that it uses to transduce that cue, and that's, you know, that, that, that cue might be, um, proteins from the pathogen present in the bloodstream and you know the sensor might might be certain immune molecules that detect that um, the sensor then generates signals you know our immune analogy these would be the cytokines um, the signals go through some control logic right so it does some computations you've got this you've got you know a sensor that picks up some information um, does some computations on that information and then that's used to produce a response um, the pathogen ha can tamper. Um, the pathogen's got some kind of tampering strategy by which it can alter the signals. Um, we, assume, we kind of assume that that's you know, the level at which it can act. So thinking about this as a game, uh, the host strategy is the choice of a control logic. You know, what control system do I use to do these calculations of how I go from signal to response? And the pathogen's strategy the, is the choice of a tampering strategy. What signals do I tamper with when? And we use what I call a universal constructor assumption, which is um, just a way to say that the pathogen can do whatever it wants to the signals. Um, but it doesn't know what the signals do, and so it doesn't know how the signals, uh, you know, signal perturbations map onto the outcome responses. So. So the pathogen's in the body, it can do whatever it wants to the signals, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have a pre-existing uh, map of, of how that's going to affect response. Um, so let's see, to do this a little bit formally, um, what we have is we have a, uh, we have a control log, so we have a sensor generates signals, S1, S2, S3. The control logic is a map from those signals to a response level, um, and then the pathogen the pathogen can, we'll just, instead of having it, you know, be able to set the signal to any value, we'll just say it can raise it, lower it, or leave it unchanged. Um, and we'll say the host is best off with the default situation. The default response is what's best for the host. We've evolved to do the best thing when we're not manipulated. Um, stronger responses are best. You know, that, and that's bad for the pathogen. Stronger responses are even worse for the pathogen. Lower responses are better for the pathogen. So this is not a zero-sum game, critically. Um, you know, both the host and the pathogen suffer if stronger than necessary responses are put in play. And that's, you know, sort of, if you think about an inflammatory response to a small infection, that's the kind of, you know, that, that matches up pretty well. Um, and so the sort of key insight to, about what makes this model work is to recognize that this control logic, the choice of a you know, control circuitry on the part of the host, um, imposes a particular, induces a, a fitness landscape for the pathogen. So the pathogen is evolving these different strategies. Um, you know, oh, move this, sig you know, increase this signal, decrease that signal. And, and what is it doing? Well, it's evolving on a fitness landscape where the fitness of the pathogen, of course, determines how it's changing um, each of these signals on different axes. Um, so if the pathogen evolves much faster than the host, which is a reasonable assumption, then the sort of pathogens, um, you know, we can think of the pathogen as taking an adaptive walk on a pre-existing landscape that the host you know, sort of puts in place and then, and then stays constant. And so, the, so what the host is trying to do effectively is put a fitness landscape into place that the pathogen can't do a good job of evolving on. So 
so we can model this uh, as a formal logic. Um, I don't want to go through the details, um, but uh, you, you know, using these formal logics, uh, so here's you know, one example of formal logic, and it's just doing various operations on the, on the signals. And what it's doing is basically saying, well, if you know, signal one gets upregulated and, um, and signal two gets, uh, gets downregulated, then that's very, very bad for the pathogen. Things are left, you know, that's left unchanged. That's sort of the normal state. Um, downregulate signal one or upregulate signal two, that's a little better. You know, do both, that's great for the pathogen. And so this fitness landscape is just a simple ramp, just a simple slanted ramp. And pathogens can very, very um, easily evolve on a landscape like that. They'll very quickly uh, reach their highest fitness. Um, here's a slightly more challenging situation. You have a different control logic, and this generates this checkerboard. So, you know, the pathogen would do best by ending up here, but any step, any single step toward that um, takes it into a fitness valley, right? And so that's going to be harder for the pathogen to evolve on. Then what we can do, what's really nice, um, you know, when, when you typically think about these sorts of uh, uh, problems in computer science, you try to prove theorems about how hard it is to learn or how long it'll take to learn. We have a particular evolutionary dynamics, namely evolution by natural selection, which we can model with, say, a Wright Fisher model or, a, uh, or something like this. And so then we can do a very, you know, very uh, precisely compute how long it takes for evolution to take place. So a system like this is very easy for the pathogen to evolve to this point. It um, takes uh, time 1 over the square root of n, where n is the pathogen population size. This one's hard for the pathogen to do. It's exponential in n, where n is the pathogen population size. Um, and so we can see there's sort of these, these differences. And then what we can do um, is actually prove, and this is sort of the main you know, result uh, from this, and, you know, this, this, by the way, you know, looks an awful lot like what John Nash wrote to the NSA. The host can construct control logics that require time that's exponential in the circuit complexity, where circuit complexity is just the number of gates needed to build the circuit, or pieces to build the circuit, um, for the pathogen to learn to exploit by natural selection. So the host can make these, uh, you know, the, the host can can make these fairly simple control logics that take exponentially long to learn. And if, and if that's not long enough, then you can just add you know, a couple of more pieces, and then that has a sort of exponential increase in cost for the, for the pathogen. Um, we can actually prove this uh, by construction. So I'm just claiming it's doable. So simply showing one example will be sufficient to prove the theorem. Um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but the basic proof is to think about um, what I call a peaks on corners um, control logic, which is much like what I showed before. Um, the pathogen does well if it hits any of the corners here, but it has to go through these fitness valleys if it moves one step at a time, right? So any single change of a, of a change any single signal, the pathogen does worse. If it manages to change all of them and land on one of the corners, then finally it does better. Um, you know, go into three dimensions, now you have something like this, right? It's like a Rubik's Cube, the it hit, the, hit the corners, it's doing great, but, you know, now it's got to move even farther through the fitness valleys as we increase the number of signals, we increase the dimensionality of this thing, um, and it takes more and more steps to get across. So, um, you know, with, with N signals, the control logic um, is going to take sort of linear number of gates to specify. But it's going to take, but the fitness valley is going to take, you know, n minus one steps to get across. I can then, you know, prove a theorem in population genetics that says that uh, a finite population takes exponential time to cross a fitness valley in steps wide, kind of no matter what the mutation scheme is, and and so on. Um, so therefore, um, you know. Building an n-dimensional peaks on corners logic, I can use a linear number of gates to uh, give the population, give the pathogen a, a problem that'll take it exponential time um, to solve, and so that that proves the the theorem. Um, so that's the application to um, 
to immune systems. I mean, I think it's fun to think about a bunch of others, but I'm going to finish just with the, you know, this also solves one other problem. I, I uh, got very interested in immunology while I was a postdoc, and I had a job already in hand, um, and so I had the luxury of, of kind of a free year, and I spent a year trying to learn um, immunology uh, from a colleague and exchange taught him game theory and, and uh, at the end of the year he was a very good game theorist and, and I knew just the basic rudiments of immunology. It's just so complicated. There's so much going on. Um, and so why? Why is immunology so darn complicated? And there's my answer. If free meds could learn it, pathogens could too. So um, that's, the, that's the way that uh, or my kind of snapshot of some ways that biological societies deal with deception um, between, between the uh, um, uh, intended parties and also deception from kind of rogue outsiders. And so this is done with Rustamantia, um, immunologist, uh, Eric Chastain, computer scientist, and Michael Lockman's an evolutionary biologist, just like I am. Yeah, Dan. Um, <clears throat> so I'm puzzling. I, I, I want to continue the conversation about the point that I raised earlier. But, okay. But mm -hmm. before I get to that, um, and, and maybe we'll cool. see if other people want to weigh in first, but I, I, I want to focus on the second half. I'd hoped it was defensively complex. It, it, it is. Well, <laughs> I am slow evolving. So um, uh, you expressed the, the addition of signal complexity is relatively low cost compared to the benefits. Yes. But in terms of the robustness of the system, that isn't necessarily the case. So right. you can, if you, if you set the default up to be non-response, right, which protects you against autoimmunity, yes. then you lose sensitivity, right? Yes. Um, and if you set the default to be response, then you risk, you know, self-damage and right. expenditure mm -hmm. of resources. Mm -hmm. and, with each additional component in the signal chain that you add, you increase the probability of, of error due to disruption, right? That is, if a whole bunch of things right. have to happen right. simultaneously in order for me to do what I'm supposed to do. That sounds, that sounds right. Um, and yeah, that's a concern because we, we haven't... Um, we haven't thought about this also in the context of kind of internal noise, um, component failure kinds of stuff. Um, I suppose there would be maybe some theory about how to design multi-component systems that were relatively robust. Um, Depends on the, on the cost of the errors, right? So if you think about something like launching nuclear weapons, yeah. right? where the cost of getting it wrong is really, really high. Right. right. What you do is you build in a whole bunch of things have to happen. Right. right? Um, uh, such that you don't act until all of them have occurred. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But the risk that you run by doing that is that you're slower and may not react uh, when you That's right. Play, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just, so it, in, in any given case, it's going to depend on the cost. Yes, the for areas. sure. For sure. There's always this type 1, type 2. Yeah, trade off that you know, like I don't Clark think it writes comes about. As cheaply as, as you implied in your kind of presentation of, well, you add another link to the signal chain and, and the problem goes up exponentially for um, uh, the pathogen to try and solve it. Well, but the problem of getting it wrong goes up too for the, for the host. It does. It does. Um, Yeah, I suppose there's, you know, there's, um, you know, w one glib response would be, but it's cheating, would be to just say, look, there's a ton of room between the linear cost to the, to the host and the exponential cost of the pathogen, and I'm going to live in there somewhere. Um, but I'm not sure that's really fair or right. I don't have a proof that the risks don't go up exponentially either. And I suppose that's what you really need to do next is to start to think about, um, you know, there's a fair bit of theory on, um, on uh, robust control logics. Um, but I don't think there's been any work on learnability of robust control logics. And so I think what 
I'd probably have to do here. Um, this is a nice ob objection and a new one I haven't heard before. Um, is go back and start thinking about learnability of robust logics. And are, is it possible to make robust logics that remain difficult to learn? Yeah. Sort of along similar lines, maybe maybe the same lines, but coming from a different direction. I'm sorry, I had to go ahead. Oh, no problem. I know you yeah, you mentioned no problem. But, um, you know, the question of why you see such evolutionary um, conservation yeah. in the basic building blocks of, of, of the immune system yeah. that you were talking about. And I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, a null or an alternate right. view would be something like an entrenchment pathogenic right. kind of story, right? Where, and, and in this case, you know, it, um, you know, what you might think is, okay, you, you've got a system that's modularized in such a way that there's a combinatorial part of the system, and, it, and, the, and the logic of it depends on, you know, shuffling up the MHC, loci, and all this stuff, and those are, those are a very highly rapidly evolving, as you would expect. Right. But then in order to implement that combinatorial system, right. you need the underlying, the underlying stuff, which is highly which, which is because... Right, because, uh, because it's locked in early, it's and, it, and, it, and, and any change exactly. messes up everything downstream. Um, you know, I think that's a real possibility, and we certainly, um, you know, so first of all, I should, the other thing I sort of didn't, you know, admit in the talk, but which is, which I'll freely admit now, is that, is that we have no explanation for how defensive complexity evolves. We only know what it does to someone else's evolution once it gets there. I don't have an evolutionary explanation of how you get it in advance, um, you know, so that's a, that's a separate issue. So, I mean, and because of that, it could be that sort of both are right. You know, it's sort of there, it's entrenched. That's why it's there. Um, it also has this defensive complexity um, property, and, and that they're both, they both kind of prevent pathogen evolution, which as a result, you know, generates stabilizing selection instead of positive selection. Um, the, let's see, the, 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 I guess the, the only other kind of answer I have to that is that the, and I don't, the problem is I don't completely believe the studies, but there have been some studies that try to look at the complexity of different control networks uh, within the body. And the um, immune system is kind of this massive outlier compared to humoral systems and other things. And so the, but that, that, that doesn't address the, the, the purifying thing, but it says, look, the immune system, if you, use the standard network metrics on the immune system, the immune system organization is fundamentally more complex than, the, um, than these other systems. I'm not 100% sure I believe that, because I, yeah. but it's, you know, it's what's I been mean, done. Just, just as a follow it seems like maybe one, one way to try to get out the models, although I realize obviously these models become really complex once you add these things in, would be to also, um, also add to the model um, uh, well because you want to be able to, 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 to model how much um, of this kind of complexity do you expect to see specifically for the function of defensive complexity as opposed to right. um, whatever else you call the sort of nuts, nuts and bolts. I mean, the, the reason that I'm thinking about this is that you, know, you, no, totally. you, you would apply the same, you, you would say just as astonishingly that there was an amazing amount of conserv uh, conservation in the genes that build limbs and right, kind right, of things between right. mice and humans, right? So the question is, are they? Well, they're not, they're not locked in an arms race. They're not, that's true. But, but, but you're right, you're, you're, you're right about this what sort of, rate of that evolution yeah, you'd expect that's right. would be something like that kind of Right, and so those right. So the serve than you would expect for something that's playing not a game against parasites, but a game uh, just against the world. Uh, that would be a very good. I, I right. So so I know that the immune control circuitry is under purifying selection, but I don't know that it's under stronger purifying selection than developmental stuff. And I should check that. Yeah. That's a yeah. That's a good idea. Jacob. So I was trying to think of some other scenarios that this kind of signal tampering game 
might apply to, and one that I uh, wonder if you've thought about looking into where you might be able to get some interesting real-time data is in algorithmic trading. So, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. as you may know, so sometimes algorithms are written basically to exploit the predictability of the trading of other algorithms, right. many of which are often held by like, slow-moving institutional investors. Right. So this would suggest that uh, one way out of the arms race between those sets of trading algorithms would be to actually implement sort of very complex procedures for aggregating the external signals that they're receiving from the market into trading decisions. Because what really matters is that that map, that decision becomes hard to predict. Um, let's see, if I'm a large outfit, I just want to think through this. I like the idea, but but if I'm a large outfit, so I, I, I kind of, maybe my picture isn't the same as yours, but I'm thinking of sort of a large trading company um, you know, that's then being exploited by some little kind of nano firm that's 17 meters from the, in, from the stock exchange and, you know, has a server there and is run by two guys out of the CS department at somewhere. And, and, um, and, and yeah, so that, so that little firm is, of course, exploiting predictabilities or regularities in, the, in what that larger firm is is doing, and the usual argument is the larger firm doesn't really care um, because it's sort of an economy of scale. This larger, this small firm is making two hundred thousand dollars a day, which is just you know ir noise for for this larger firm. Um, so the larger firm could indeed do these things, but um, and put the small firm out of business. I have no question about that. It's not obvious to me that the large firm makes more money by putting the small firm out of business, because the large firm is really worried about these three other large firms. Um, so, so I mean, my understanding is that in some cases, this kind of exploitation can be damaging. OK. Um, mm -hmm. So it's the situation where you have like a uh, pension fund or something that's being exploited by an investment bank, mm -hmm. more of a setup. Like oh, so a larger, a lar a larger uh, uh, exploiter. I mean, it would seem like a very sensible thing to, to do. Um, I wonder if you, I mean, it's quite interesting. I wonder if you need it. I mean, the sort of, um, the stock market already seems defensively complex um, in the sense that sort of nobody has any idea what it's doing. Um, and, you know, and there are theorems about why it should be such. Um, and, and that if it weren't, it would become such. Um, but I guess, I guess the idea is, yeah, with these small scale, I don't, um, I'm trying to think about the, the alternatives between sort of closing the vulnerability versus, you know, as they're discovered versus engineering this the system to be very hard to find the vulnerabilities, I guess. So what would your expectation be? I mean, if you wanted to actually you know, do the empirical thing, would you expect that these big firms actually have already gotten this right? Or that, or what would you expect to see? Like, what's the empirical? I mean, I guess I might put it the other way around and say, to the degree to which, because I mean, of course, they, these uh, algorithms will be proprietary and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, one would expect to see over time a sequential closing of these exploitation opportunities and one simple hypothesis that who knows how the heck you would validate, although it's possible that you could maybe do it by trying to re reverse engineer the decision logic. Yeah. Um, would be through implementing one of these kind of defensively complex maps from the market signal to their decision. It's a neat idea. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's really, I mean, it is true that it would be disastrous if it were easy to reverse engineer. I mean, I think, I think for the same reason, you, the, the uh, uh, academic study would, would be doomed from the start because um, if it is defensively complex, you can't reverse engineer it. Um, but if, you know, yeah, if, 
if you get a few of your friends at Bear Stearns or whatever, whoever is still in business to, to leak their, their algorithms, maybe we could do it. Before you get put in jail. Before you get put in jail. You have to code fast. Yeah. Yeah, Dan. Part um, the sparrow yeah. badges. Um, it's always seemed to me that there's a there's an important distinction between um, signals which are honest by virtue of themselves and signals which are honest by virtue of the interactions that ensue because of the signal. Okay, so the peacock's tail is very different than the sparrow's badge because the it, not because one is costly and the other is cheap. That's true of the first phenotypic manifestation in the chain of events. Mm -hmm. But it isn't true ultimately. So the, the badge is cheap for the sparrow, but the, 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 the costs of um, falsely signaling, which is essentially what the, yeah. the, the, um, what the peacock relies on also, right, mm -hmm. are prohibitive for the individual who is deceptive. Right, right. And, and that always has to be true for honest signals. So the, the, the difference is, is primarily temporal. It's not just phenotypic, right? It's that in, in, for the peacock, there's only one round, right? There's mm -hmm. the, I show my tail, and you know something. Mm -hmm. For the sparrow, there have to be multiple rounds, and the costs are, are still present. They're just not present in the first round. They're present in the second round. And so... One of two things has to happen in order for there to be multiple rounds, and this is what I was alluding to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems to me it's an empirical question, and it may vary from case to case across species. Mm -hmm. There might be patterns, right? One of two things has to happen. Uh, either we just constantly, basically, um, uh, uh, butt heads, which means that we're ignoring the signals um, to a large extent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the signals are not really signals then. They're kind of epiphenomena, right? Um. It, so the story with the, the story with the pe with the sparrows. I'm not sure it's right. Is that the um, signals save a tremendous amount of time right. by being quick to assess most of the time. So, so that suggests that we don't just you know challenge everybody we see. We're paying attention to them, right? Which is right. all the ethology on the signals right. on the sparrows says, right? So the, the second has to be that it's not the sole signal, right? That that um, uh, and therefore it's much less of a signal than those who describe it, who champion this particular example, for example, um, uh, would have it be. It has to be a bunch of other stuff, right? It has to be, oh, you know what? You're, you got a big badge, but you're showing an appeasement display. So I'm going to kick your butt now. Or, oh, you got a big badge, but you know, you're letting me get to the very patch first. So I'm going to mm -hmm. kick your butt right now, or whatever it is, right? It might be other signals, but it could also be, I mean, I think there, it's worth making a signal cue distinction there. So the, you know, the cues are things that convey information but didn't evolve right, right. for that purpose. Just, I just, um, and, and so um, I agree that there have to be, you know, there basically have, you know, either there has to be some really good reason to just probe everybody, like you, which, you know, or there have to be some secondary cues. Uh, but if there are difference in, I mean, so there's a bunch of theory that people are doing right now that I haven't thought about as much as I should have about differences in assessment costs. And so I suspect that, that, that this is important in this particular case. My assessment cost of your badge is zero, or close to it, because I just glance up. Um, you know, my assessment cost of your size is a little more. I've got to come over there. My assessment cost of your fighting ability is quite high and depends on your fighting ability. Um, it may, I don't, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I guess I would, I would imagine that you know the reason. I mean, there's something that's there's something that's making this badge of status uh, system go through. It's very common in birds. It's you know evolved many many times in parallel. Um, it's doing something, and and it's obvious it's obviously a signal. And so it's like, why is that signal useful in the context of that um, uh, you know particular behavioral ecology that that, that they have? Um, but it's, it's really different than the peacock's tail because it's really just a shorthand. And it doesn't, the shorthand by itself is not informative. If that's all there was, no one would pay attention to the shorthand. 
it has to be either signals or cues. So the, mm -hmm. I mentioned the appeasement display, which yeah. is a signal. That's a signal, yeah. Or not right. going to the berry patch, which is a cue. Right, right. right. Um, uh, but there have to be a bunch of other things. And so it's all those other things where, where some of the costs now lie, right? Um, and so the fact that that first move in an iterated game is cheap is a lot less puzzling if you realize that it's just the first move. And the peacock isn't making just a first move. The peacock is, that's the only that's move the final. Game. That's the final move. Again, I guess what you're saying is another you know, quite reasonable way to frame it. Um, I think you know, what we often do you know, in sort of as ethologists is we'll, there'll be some trait, and we point to that, and we say, look at that signal. Um, yeah, and then we say, why is that signal honest? And so the story I tell in some way um, focuses on the shape of the cost curves and suppresses the temporal structure. I mean, if we go way back, I'm not going to go back, but if we go way back to these, you know, why, do, uh, why punish, um, that already is sort of imposing this, you know, that's sort of acknowledging that, you know, there is this temporal um, structure that, that requires, you know, response moves on the part of the recipient that are going to, you know, then have advantages or disadvantages in later rounds. I, I, I was initially confused because when, I, when you were saying rounds, I was thinking um, uh, iterated play of the same game. No, no, no. But this is actually like well, a mul this is a multi stage. It's, it, they're really stages okay, of an extended better. form game. Yeah, I don't just keep flashing my badge. That's yeah, that's right. No, it's, 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 you've got a multi stage extended form game. And yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. And, you know, I don't, I don't think it's mysterious when you put it in those terms any more. You know, I mean, it, it's self evidently true why appeasement and threat displays evolve, which is that it's cheaper for both parties in this context right. to honestly advertise because there's checking, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. No, I don't think it's so. It's so mysterious. It's the the notion that signals had to be costly to be honest was remarkably sticky in biology. So yeah, but it's starting from scratch. It doesn't seem so mysterious. We're almost done, but I just one comment on that. I'm, I mean, I don't. I mean, I think it's an interesting observation about this case, but I don't. I. I doubt that it's a general property that the evolution of cost-free conventions requires that there be checking. So it doesn't have to be ontogenetic checking in order for a cost-free convention to evolve. It's not, it's, not, it's not the case that because individuals can check during their lifetime that the convention is right um, is what stabilizes it. It can be done over evolutionary time as well, right? Because you could also have other kinds of conventions evolve um, that, don't, that don't require that. Can you, can you give me a little more of an example? Oh, can you give me a little more of an example? I'd, I'd like, I'd like it to be right. So I want to understand uh, well, it. Well, I, I mean, I guess we could talk about this later. Over yeah, lunch. let's do it over well, lunch. The question is, is that the checking? There has to be a checking mechanism, right? There has to be some feedback mechanism right. that stabilizes it. Right. Does that feedback mechanism have to be in the brain of the individual that's implementing the convention? Ah. Not necessarily, right? It, it has to be. Um, it has to be there, and it has to stabilize it, stabilize the system on an evolutionary time scale. But it seems like one possibility is that you could have a system that says, I'm going to check and push you and see if you're really that big, if I doubt the signal is right. But I'm just, I'm just saying it seems to me I, that it's not, it's not, that can't be a prerequisite for, for arbitrary conventions that are stable to, to hmm. evolve. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be conjecture. I don't it would be fun to think of some good examples. Great. Skeptical, but we're out of time. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attendance.